think I have to say that Fritjof Nansen actually is my favourite explorer in, in some ways. I think he was such a charismatic character and I think had he really been given the proper opportunity to go to the South Pole, he probably would have made it before Amundsen. He was sort of Amundsen's mentor really and he did some extraordinary journeys in, in the Arctic. In the Antarctic, I think, of the people that we have in our book that I really focus on most, I think probably Shackleton. Again, because he's another charismatic character, and um, there were so many different layers to Shackleton, and he was so sort of flawed in many ways as a person. You know, he was scatterbrained, he, 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 was, um, he, he had a lot of energy, but he didn't know quite where to put it, and um, so he had a lot of financial yes. problems, and you know, all his harebrained ideas about what he wanted to do and how he's going to make his fortune. And, but he was such an incredible character, and he just had such a love and respect for his men, and was a fantastic leader. And I think I probably respect him more than any of the other explorers um, of the heroic age, certainly in, in the Antarctic. My father had a, a yeah, most fantastic library of, of polar books and some of the beautiful original first editions of Amundsen's journey and um, particularly Amundsen actually because my dad had taken his books down to the Antarctic when he was a young man. So dad had gone down to the Antarctic when he was in his early 20s and had become a surveyor and ended up mapping several thousand, tens of thousands of square miles of, of Antarctica and spent five years down there. And, went to a lot of the huts of you know, Scott and Shackleton and Northern Scott and all these different places. So he had this incredible personal connection with not just Antarctica as a place, but also the history of it um, and the people themselves. He'd retraced a lot of the routes. And so you know, we've got this wonderful edition of Amazon's South Pole book, which is bound in, in my dad's own he sewed it himself a, a sledging case and he carried it with him when he was retracing Amundsen's route. And so it's, it's well thumbed and well travelled and, and objects like that, you know, I, well, I just love them. They're really inspiring as they are. We've actually got a portrait, a picture of, of that book in South Pole because, you know, it's, it was such a crucial thing for me growing up. There were these objects which I found particularly intriguing. And so... So yes, I, I, I grew up with these stories and, um, and Dad telling me stories of going to Scott's hut and Shackleton's hut and, and having this real sense of their presence still being there. It was almost as if they were haunted is, is maybe a bad word, but that suddenly the spirit of the men before him, because there really hadn't been that much time between my dad's travels and that of Scott and Shackleton. So he felt an intense connection with them and really felt that he was sort of carrying on the expedition spirit. So, so it's been a great book from that point of view for me to work on because I've been able to go back to the stories that my dad's told. You know, I was working from this wonderful book my dad carried and we took extracts from, from Amazon's book there and, and stories that my dad told me as well. So we've got a wonderful extract that my dad finally wrote down for me about visiting Scott and Jackson's huts. And so... So I, I, do, I had to include those because they're very personal, but I think also they give a wonderful sense of, of place and how the human spirit has, has um, sort of embodied certain parts of the Antarctic, which is such an impersonal place. You really can't make a human mark, if you like, on Antarctica. It's constantly, you know, with the winds and the... I mean, if, if there were no humans on there at all, if everybody left, yeah, the, all the huts, everything would, would, would disappear in, in a, a few decades. So, um, but there are these little pockets of human kindly feeling, I think my dad put it something like that, of, of you know, this, this lovely warmth of human spirit in such a vast and desolate. I think it's really interesting looking at the different characters of different explorers and of course I feel that I've got sort of inside, I don't know, connection with a lot of these explorers from seeing the way that my dad operated and the kind of character that he was, you know, he was incredibly focused individual and um, 
and actually a very gentle individual. And, and of course, all these different explorers are markedly different. So, I mean, a classic example is the difference between Scott Shackleton and, and Amundsen. Amundsen was was a very clinical explorer in many ways. You know, he was, um, which is also in a sense a, a, a similar trait with Nansen. They were. Um, they researched meticulously what they were doing. They developed their own um, traveling equipment and um, they did an awful lot of research with certain sort of tribes of Inuit and that sort of thing. So, so they felt they had a, a real connection with the place and travel and they were fantastic skiers and that sort of thing. And, and so they had, um, they, they had a very sort of um, good mindset and it was all about achieving and the goal and that sort of thing. Scott was um, was a very different beast. You know, he was prone to bouts of melancholia and and, um, and very depressed and, and constantly, you know, doubting himself as a leader and explorer and whether he should be doing this, that, and the other. And and, um, and actually, from other research, I've discovered that actually his his wife Kathleen was really um, a driving force behind him and going to the South Pole. To actually achieve the pole itself, and in his chest pocket, he he had a note from her, scrawled in pencil, saying, "You must go to the South Pole. Don't let thoughts of the family make you turn back." Basically, in reference to Shackleton, who had turned back from probably seven miles from the pole um, because he was worried about the lives of his men and thinking of home, and, and knew that he could have easily got to the South Pole, but may not have made it back, and he wasn't willing to take that risk. Whereas Scott was, and um, but I think a lot of that was Kathleen sort of giving him permission mm. to do that and driving him to do that. It's no holds barred note this one, you know. So so things like that are really interesting. And from my dad's perspective, he was also a very very driven individual, and um, and also had this incredible connection. He had gone and spent a lot of time in Northwest Greenland learning how to to survive in the polar environment without getting frostbite, you know, learning the tra traditional methods of polar travel and went then across the Arctic Ocean by dog sledge for 16 months without coming off the ice, you know, really was the most extraordinary journey, a, a real heroic journey, really. So, so yes, I, I, I could see my dad and I can see the heroic age explorers and I sort of feel like I understand them in a strange I think when we started approaching the idea of, of writing something for the centenary, um, we wanted to do something completely different. There, there were lots of books about this sort of supposed race to the South Pole between Amundsen and Scott, which was never a race. You know, um, Amundsen, of course, wanted to get, knew that Scott was going to the South Pole and wanted to beat him to it, but, um, but there was never any public race um, between the two of them. So, um, and actually the, the whole idea of going to the South Pole um, needed to be opened out, we felt. You know, what was, it, what was the attraction of the South Pole? Why would people want to go there in the first place? So, and as a geographical marker, it's very important. So, first, first people to the South Pole, obviously that's you know, incredibly important. And, and for the early explorers, nobody knew what was there. There was this sort of idea of this incredible utopia, this land of riches. So, when they were in the middle of empire building, you know, there was this sort of sense of, gosh, you must go and conquer this, this wonderful, temperate, beautiful place. And, um, and of course it turned out to be a frigid wilderness with, with nothing surviving there apart from a few penguins and killer whales around the coast. But I think what we really found fascinating was, was the sort of allure of the South Pole, really, you know, beyond the fact, beyond the point of it being discovered by, by Amundsen and Scott and, you know, planting the flag. You know, why are people still attracted by the South Pole? Why is it still a place that people want to go to? And so we felt it was, it was more important really to give a sense of the draw of, of Antarctica as well and, and the South Pole. It's sort of biography of the Pole itself, really. Um, to, to draw on all these incredible writings about the Pole. You know, it's inspired so many writers, it's inspired artists, it's inspired poets. So we wanted to sort of bring all this together and have this treasure trove of um, ideas and musings about, about this extraordinary place that really is just a, a spot in the middle of, of nowhere. It's just a 
frozen place and if we didn't have the Amundsen Scott base there, there would be absolutely nothing there, just you know, a windy plateau. So we really wanted to sort of bring something more to it really and also bring it back up to date and sort of look at why modern adventurers still want to go to this place and even if it's a what we call a last degree expedition where you've flown in and you just walk the last few miles and feel like you've done something absolutely heroic and, and of course it is a great challenge for people but um, it's nothing like the great expeditions of the heroic age and um, but it's all interesting and it's all influences people in very different ways so One of, the, one of the great things with this book was it was an opportunity also to bring together some fantastic visual treasures as well as you know beautiful written words and wonderful pieces of poetry and that sort of thing. There is such a wonderful treasure trove of imagery from paintings, um, photography, um, even through to graphic art. So we uh, commissioned a graphic artist to do what we call the end papers, um, which you'll see, and, and it was... We'd asked all sorts of scientists, explorers, writers, poets, artists to um, give um, three sort of three words or five words about what they what the South Pole meant to them. You know, what what conjured up their sort of feelings of the South Pole, and it was really for us originally to get a sense of where the book might go. And it was just it was just an interesting sort of experiment, and it was so fascinating the answers we got. And um, what we really wanted to do was create a very original artwork um, inspired by the South Pole, which has inspired other people. So we took all these words, gave them to this wonderful graphic artist, Andy Smith, and he came up with this, what we think is an absolutely fantastic piece of work. And um, you can see it here. And it's, it really is just very unusual, very unique. And... Um, I, I love just gazing at it anyway, just because I, I find it fascinating, there's so much in there. And completely conflicting ideas, complementary ideas about, about South Pole, and really very, very special. And this is, this is what's so interesting about the South Pole, and why this book is so interesting, that um, there's so many different ideas about what it is, about, you know, some people think it's an incredibly hostile place, some people find it a magical place. And, um, and so to bring in some of the images to this book w was also incredibly difficult and challenging because there's so much. And um, Heather Ponting's beautiful photographs are sort of an obvious thing, but they're absolutely beautiful and they're iconic. And, so, and also then to bring in some other bits and pieces that people may never have seen before. Some wonderful posters that Shackleton and Scott used on their lecture tours and that sort of thing and promoting their films and these huge lectures they had to to do right around the country and all over the world actually to raise money and support for the next expedition to find the South Pole. So all these wonderful bits and pieces that, that we brought together, we're avid collectors, Hugh and myself as well, so we've got quite a wonderful co personal collection and wanted to bring that in. So um, yeah, it's a bit of a feast, a visual feast. <laughs> Um, I went to Greenland, as I said, um, when I was 10 months old, and my daughter is about to turn 10 months, and uh, so we think it's high time that she should be donning her polar gear and getting out into the polar wild. So, um, yes, we're hoping to take her next spring up to northwest Greenland and meet my friends and family out there <laughs> and uh, give her a wonderful sort of introduction into a place that's influenced me tremendously, and also Hugh. I mean, Hugh's fascinated by the polar bull will us too and um, so that'll be a wonderful experience to take her up there and um, it's been a few years since I've been up there too so so it'd be wonderful to go up there with the family and spend spend some time with her and her and my, my lovely unique friend.